I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here. Earlier than you expected, I know. This is a special episode that I'm putting out just as an extra added bonus so that you shouldn't go hungry in between CHP episodes. And I'm most delighted to have on the program Dr. Brandon Gauthier, author of a new book called Before Evil, fresh out of the oven from Tortoise Books, a publishing house located in my old hometown of Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Gauthier has a Ph.D. in modern history from Fordham University in New York City, where he remains an adjunct professor. And he lives the good life up in New Hampshire, where he's director of global education at Dairy Field School. Welcome to the CHP, Brandon. Did I get that last name right? Uh, well, well, Laszlo, first off, it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you. I love your show. I'm a listener. I really enjoy it. So awesome to be able to talk with you. Uh, my last name, you accomplished the rare feat of saying my last name correctly while still mispronouncing it. Because normally in New Hampshire, people will say Gauthier, and this hurts my heart a little bit. Uh, and the French pronunciation is Gauthier, uh, but I am from Louisiana, and a Cajun French uh, perversion of Gauthier becomes Gaucher, uh, which phonetically is a bit of a nightmare, but it makes for an interesting opening uh, exchange. So yes, Gaucher, G-A-U-T-H-I-E-R for our listeners. Got it. What kind of modern history did you study at Fordham? So specifically, my specialty was the United States and East Asia, and I particularly zeroed in on the history of U.S.-North Korean relations. And uh, I wanted to understand not only the events that have created great uh, enmity between the United States and the DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, formerly put, I wanted to understand how Americans have thought about North Korea and through an American lens. And that process of writing my dissertation enabled me to go to North Korea. It enabled me to study this in great depth. And what I found was you know, North Korea is ruled by a heinous regime, which has committed grave crimes against humanity with its own people. Yet what I really found as well was that Americans have often completely failed to understand North Korea as a product of Korean history. Uh, and that the United States has constantly formulated what North Korea is in the context of our own interest, right, through the Cold War uh, or through the War on Terror. And what's lost in this is, again, an appreciation for Korean history and that North Korea is explicable, uh, that the, the ideological viewpoint of the leaders, uh, we can explain it. It doesn't excuse what North Korea has done, but uh, I, I found a story of ideas which is much more complex much than only condemning the North Korean state for its acts. You know, 12 years of doing the CHP, Mao Zedong was one of the first topics I wrote down in this long stream of consciousness, you know, brainstorming future topic ideas. Yet all these years, I never gave Mao the same CHP treatment I gave Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping. A standalone series on Mao is a topic on the CHP. There's too much meat there. I'd be better off starting a new show. He's gotten plenty of mentions, though, in all the episodes I produced on PRC and CCP history. And that's why it's particularly special to have you on, because I've never spoken about any of this before. So your new book, Before Evil, it looks at the early formative years of six dictators. Besides Mao, you examine Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, and Kim Il-sung, their parents, the conditions of their youth, and which people and events shaped them. So let's speak to Mao's experience, as this is the China History Podcast and all. But you could feel free to speak to the broader picture as well, you know, with the other lives. So first off, what were the three caveats you mentioned at the beginning about how the reader should approach this book? So there's some crucial things that have to be said before we can even start a conversation that is inherently about trying to humanize dictators who do some terrible things, but are immensely important in the larger story of history. So the, the first essential caveat is, is to make clear that no 
amount of humanizing details, no amount of trying to make these individuals explicable. And what do I mean by trying to make individuals explicable? I mean to engage their ideas seriously, to not begin with the assumption that every dictator is driven only by a lust for power and this kind of cynicism, they will dominate and be the ultimate power within a given country. I look at the story of dictators as being one about the power of ideas to inform their notion of best interest, what is right and wrong. But the first absolutely essential caveat in that regard is that no humanizing details about these dictators, no degree of feelings that we conjure up for them can matter when compared with their later crimes. And what I mean by that is to make whether it be Stalin or whether it be Mao or whether it be Lenin or Hitler or Kim Il-sung and Mussolini, more explicable to explain them in no way can excuse the things that they did that caused great harm and that we can transcend a more simplistic conversation where we only demonize uh, by looking at their ideas. But as we do that, that doesn't diminish the reality of the fact that uh, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution caused extraordinary misery for many, many, many millions of people. Now, one criticism that you know a listener might bring up as we talk about humanizing these individuals, someone might say, right, why should we care about Mao reading the water margin as a kid uh, compared to up to 45 million people starving to death in the, after the Great Leap Forward? Shouldn't we be focusing more on that? Uh, and that is something that has resonated with me. So the book opens with the description of these individuals' uh, crimes when it comes to causing so much suffering for their people. And this caveat of no, human, no humanizing details diminish the horror of their actions, that has to be set up front. Uh, the other is, is that we're so eager, Laszlo, to find like history to be like a math problem. You know, We want to zero in on there certainly must be this two plus two equation, which equals four, which definitively tells us how we get to uh, you know, heinous acts, right? And what do I mean by heinous acts? What do I mean by evil? I mean acts that show a distinct lack of empathy for the suffering of others. And even as we seek to make these stories more explicable, to engage their ideas, this is not about definitively explaining to listeners how a uh, Mao Zedong comes to be. Uh, that is, it is not that simple. History is not a math problem. We cannot come away with a neat list of lessons about you know, definitively how do we get to that point. And then the other is, the third caveat, th- this is not psychohistory. Uh, I, I am not approaching this as a trained psychiatrist who's going to break down you know, psychopathological traits of narcissism and so on. Uh, we cannot resurrect uh, Mao or Stalin or Mussolini from the dead and engage in a year-long uh, conversation with a trained psychiatrist and then come to responsible diagnoses. Even if we could resurrect him from the dead and have an extensive psychopathological uh, process of diagnosing, you know, kind of what made him tick in that regard. Even that is not going to give us a foolproof understanding of how such individuals come to be. Diagnoses exist on the spectrum. And just because someone suffers from a given uh, psychopathological condition, this does not, does not preordain them to commit crimes necessarily. That some people, for instance, like neurosurgeons can suffer from psycho, psychopathic tendencies. Uh, and and so it's far more complex than cycle history can ever allow. So, you know, number one, we're not excusing dictators as we seek to explain them. You know, n- number two, it is not so easy as assuming that this is going to be like a math problem. We come away with a formula about how all of this happens and how we can prevent it definitively in the future. And I don't think cycle history is the best approach. So why does Mao's youth remain relevant for understanding Chairman Mao, the leader of the PRC from 1949 to 1976? Well, I would return to what he says in January 1958, when just as you have you know, the beginning process of the Great Leap Forward just about to unfold, his core point that, you know, that China is like an atom and that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, will smash it open and create a nuclear chain reaction of energy, destruction for the sake of creation. And, and we see this kind of common denominator point throughout the course of his time in power, that we must break down and destroy the old China for the sake of renewing it, right? For realizing a new and better China. There are many reasons you know, why that comes to be, this, this line of thought. And, and as I was just saying about psychopathological tendencies, I don't reject that there are these elements in Mao's thinking that this is not part of the story. It is. But what I privilege in this story is the power of ideas. And if we are to understand the Great Leap Forward, I, I don't think it's best to only try to interpret it through the lens of, of Mao's uh, you know, mental condition, right? But through the ideas he believes. 
It is Mao who believes at the height of his power that he could break down China and renew it. Where does that idea come from? What, what are the origins of that line of thinking? And we'll see it in the Cultural Revolution, literally. You will have kids tasked, Red Guards, with destroying the old China to raid the grave or the tomb of Confucius. Where does that come from? Mao's youth is absolutely essential for understanding the origins of ideas that lead him to believe these things. It takes shape in the course of growing up in a China that had fallen prey to foreign imperialism, the suffering and misery of a great nation, suffering before what were viewed as foreign predators, preying on it, and returning to a classroom uh, at the Hunan First Normal School with Yang Changchi, a teacher really driving home this notion that we will have to destroy what is broken to, to rebuild. It's too simplistic to draw a direct line from that to the Great Leap Forward of the Cultural Revolution, but it's a really important part of the puzzle about where Mao's ideas come from and where does the notion that he believes what he's doing is right. And that's so important to note. Mao Zedong, to whatever extent, he acts in an evil way, a lack of feeling and empathy for those suffering, inherently believes what he is doing is going to work and that to destroy the old China is the right thing to do. That story, a, a crucial element, a element of it begins in his youth. There's more to be said there, but I think that's a good opening point along those lines. So let's talk about Mao's childhood and his parents and about how it was for him growing up in a rich peasant household in rural Hunan, in the famous Shaoshan. How did that shape his early years? His mother, when she may, she was as saintly as they came. I dare say she might even give Mengzi's mother a run for her money as far as her devotion to her son went. Well, it begs the question, right, of, you know, the point of before evil, the point of my book, which is people would, I think, bring the popular assumption that Mao Zedong's childhood was definitively shaped by probably trauma. You know, how do we get individuals to behave with a lack of empathy? I think kind of the fallback answer is, well, surely they were deeply mistreated, right? And, and that's what caused this distinct lack of feeling as adults. Uh, we see something uh, much more complicated than Mao's youth. We see, A, he does have a father who's very stern, um, that Mao Yichong is someone who is extremely demanding uh, of his kids uh, and, and is uh, abusive at times. Uh, you know, we can talk about Mao in 1971 meeting with the prime minister of Japan, where he'll go from, you know, talking about the strength of a cocktail, to kind of like looking off in the distance and saying, my father was very harsh and unkind, right? So like there are these moments where Mao's childhood resurfaces in him as an adult, and he actually will even say uh, that if his father was alive, and, and we're talking at the, the, towards the end of his life, he'll actually say, if my father were alive in 1968, when Mao is 75, he brings up that, you know, I would have him jet plane. I, I would have his head shoved down and his arms pulled back painfully behind him, like arrows about to shoot off in the distance. The latter part of that is my own words. Uh, but, but Mao says jet plane. And so for listeners, you know, cultural revolution, we're going to pull people's arms back and it's going to be this kind of form of physical uh, a f form of physical torture as people are being subjected to struggle sessions. So, but that's not the defining story in terms of Mao's childhood. That's part of the puzzle. It is important. The defining part of Mao's childhood, I would argue, is Wen Chi Mei, his mother. It is a, a home, uh, first off, that is not one that is deeply impoverished. Uh, and before we go into Chi Mei, his mother, I will say this further about Yi Chang, that this is not a home uh, like so many Chinese at this time in which they are really suffering and struggling in dire poverty. Uh, this is a home of, quote unquote, rich peasants, as Mao himself will admit. His father was quite a capitalist. His father, actually, his life is a small success story. He is able to pull himself up. Uh, his dad, uh, Yi Chang, is born into a debt-ridden family, and his dad is able to overcome that, to have his own farm. Uh, and to be really successful. He, he is able to essentially have a nice home. And so point number one about Mao's childhood, it's not necessarily that he has an abusive, stern father. That matters. But it's that he grows up in a privileged childhood. He grows up in a home which he has certain advantages that other students don't. Okay, uh, before we get to Chime, let's elaborate. What are those advantages? Well, he has access to a, a level of education that his father's determined to see him achieve. His father wants Mao to be able to basically be able to speak to Confucian teachings that would help in the legal system and to be able to help him on the farm, not just doing farm work, right, but to help him with running the farm in terms of the numbers entailed. Uh, and so 
he has access to an education. He is able to embrace the later ideas that we'll talk about in the very beginning because he has certain advantages other people don't. And then let's get to his mother, Chime. She is um, a lovely, lovely person who adores her son. She's illiterate, but she's not lacking self-confidence. She's, she's intelligent. She argues with Yi Chong uh, and, and will strategize with young Mao about how to deal with their father. And Mao will say, remembering her, I worshipped my mother. Quote, wherever my mother went, I would follow. Uh, historians have noted that, you know, it was her interest in Buddhism, her interest in how one could take a distinctive ethical stance. Like, what could you do to improve the world around you? Mao's earliest exposure to that is through his mom and through the notion of Buddhism, that you cannot serve your fellow man if you're unwilling to pursue larger accomplishments for the sake of others. Uh, when his mom dies in 1919, she is just 53 years old. Uh, you know, young Mao is just 26. And it crushes him. He'll deliver an oration at her funeral and say that the quote the noblest aspect of mother's character was her impartial love that extended to all. The heart-rending details of her sufferings uh, are too numerous numerous for me to write down. But it goes on to say that you know as for her unaccomplished wishes, like to make the world a better place. We pledge to fulfill them. Young Mao will say, my heart is set and determined. And now, Laszlo, things are getting messier. Things are getting more complicated. We're not just seeing the future dictator being abused as a young man by a stern father. We're seeing a flesh and blood human being who genuinely loved his mother, whose mother genuinely loved him, who looked at her son and, and encouraged him to think about what will you do with this life? If only she had known that Mao's future would lead to the death of all of her other children. Yeah, quite ironic. You also write about uh, Xiao Zi Sheng Xiaoyu in the book. He was the childhood friend of Mao from school, and he was the from the next town over, south of Shaoshan. What about him? Yeah, Xiao Zi Sheng is really important in terms of the story of Mao's childhood. It's kind of another one of those curiosities at first glance that have kind of been lost. Uh, that we do have a primary source that describes, you know, Mao at the first normal school in Hunan and, and who he was uh, on the verge of discovering all of these ideas. So, you know, we take um, Xiao Yu's book, and I'll call him Xiao Yu for the sake of convenience in this moment, because this is the, you know, the name he is going by. Um, he writes this book that Mao Zedong and I were, were beggars. And he describes Mao at great length of what he was like when they were training to be teachers. And it has to be treated cautiously. Xiao Yu's memories of Mao are colored by their later antipathy for each other. There's a lot of direct quotes, you know, that decades after the fact, you have to ask, how could you remember those quotes word for word? But what comes across about Mao and the story of his youth as a young student at the first normal school, studying to be a teacher, is again one that is more complicated than we would otherwise assume. We see a young person who, as Xiao Yu will remember, quote, every morning I used to hear him reading aloud from the old classics. He studied hard. We see a young person in school who is not just you know, acting callously and being kind of the cruel mass murderer that we would want to boil this down to. Uh, we see someone who's obsessed with history, literature, philosophy, uh, we see someone who bonds with other people like Xiao Yu. They're both uh, they're both from Hunan province. Um, they both like they, they both they both like uh, peppercorns too much. Uh, and we see the first description of him right uh, at this level of uh, a greater degree of detail as he's on the verge of all these ideas. Xiao Yu will describe him as quote quite an ordinary, normal looking person with eyes that were neither large nor penetrating. He spoke slowly and was no means a talented orator. His gait uh, kind of reminded one of a duck waddling, quote unquote, but it was um, their mutual love of ideas. It, it was the fact that Mao found a companion who, you know, they would argue Mao didn't like to clean his room and Mao didn't care about his appearance. And he would make jokes about it. You know, how could I change the world if I was so obsessed with my appearance? Could there be anything more insignificant? Uh, but what he wants to talk about is Bismarck. You know, what he wants to talk about, uh, to put it plainly, are big ideas, and so we see from the earliest years of Mao in school through sources like this, not only things that are disturbing, though that'll come with Xiao Yu's interactions, uh, how he describes him, how he changes over time. We see a young person fascinated with the power of ideas, an ardent bibliophile who's um, thinking about the world as genuine 
It's not just a power-hungry cynicism that we only want to see in the story of Mao and which really reduces the story to something that lacks the, the flesh and blood nuance of real life. You cited Xiao Zisheng's book, Mao Zedong and I Were Beggars. So whatever became of that childhood relationship with Mao after he became such a major figure on the political scene in China? They will ultimately fall out, right? And um, this will this will take place for a number of reasons. But ultimately, by the early 1920s, you have Mao moving more towards communism. Um, and really, there what arises between, between Xiao Yu and Mao is that Mao's historical rationalization of the meaning of reality, to put it quite simply, is the notion of the heroic figure who is going to make hard decisions for the greater good. You know, as we'll talk about here, perhaps in a little bit, you know, Mao's affinity for Chinese history, uh, that you know, the, the thinking of Mao is that, you know, if we take an emperor like Liu Bang, um, you know, that this was a leader who did what he had to do. Yes, he turned on his friends and allies, right? But he wouldn't have made it long if he hadn't. And the great heroic leader will be unafraid to make the hard decisions. And sometimes that leader will have to undertake even cruel or vicious acts for a larger ideological end. What happens between Xiao Yu and Mao is they fall out over this notion of what should the path to progress be? And, you know, by the mid-1920s, as they're falling out, they will separate, uh, you know, and, and Red Star over China, Mao mentions him, which is another corroboration of this story. And we're not even getting to the point where they wander around Hunan province as beggars and live off and live off the generosity of strangers, which is a wild story itself, right? Um, but ultimately, Mao will mention him in Red Star over China, Edgar Snow, and will essentially say he ends up stealing a bunch of money under the Guomindong and flees China. You know, the, the reality is that he ends up living in Uruguay for a time. And um, it is, you know, not what Xiao Yu does in the aftermath of his friendship with Mao that's really the defining element of what he contributes to our historical understanding of Mao. It's his ability to describing it, describe him at this time before he was evil, so to speak, right? Which is the framing of the book at, at a different time in his life. But you know, Mao corroborates their friendship. He speaks to it. That was such a fascinating exchange that you included in the book when young Mao and Xiao Yu were discussing the good and bad points of Liu Bang, and Mao would refute whatever criticism Xiao Yu gave Liu Bang. It was like hearing a 20-year-old Mao already making excuses for all the horrors he signed off on many decades later. Ah, well... Well, this is the crucial point of debate, right? Because again, we're going to see, and, and by the way, to be clear, when we're talking about Mao, right, you know, the structural conditions that will create the People's Republic of China, you know, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, all this kind of societal upheaval, not all this can just be boiled down to Mao, right? So I, I admit that up front as we're talking about this. There's myriad factors in why all of that happens. We can't only draw a neat line of Mao's childhood, but this is absolutely an important part of the story. And it is the question of, is, you know, early 20-something Mao talking about, you know, Emperor Liu Bang uh, from 202 BCE because he is speak, seeking to justify horrible things he will do in the future? Or is it because he really believes uh, a worldview in which the great hero will have to make hard decisions? Here, here's an exchange from that conversation. You know, when, when Mao will just throw out that, you know, this emperor had been a great hero, Xiao Yu will be appalled. He'll say you know, he was a tyrant who got rid of one despot only to become another himself, and, and Mao will fire back, right? And, and again, as we read these quotes, we have to be critical. You know, this is, you know, uh, Xiao Yu translating this in his own mind years later. But I, I think there is a lot to suggest that the flavor of this conversation will be borne out by Mao's life. So when Xiao Yu says, you know, this is ridiculous, what are you talking about? Uh, Mao Zedong and I were beggars says that Mao says the following. I suppose that you think after his revolutionary forces had gained control of the country, he should have established a democratic republic. 2,000 years ago, democratic republics had never been thought of. People never heard of such a form of government. It was impossible to even visualize that. Xiao Yu fires back, quote, but even if he couldn't visualize a democratic republic, he at least could have avoided being a cruel despot. Mao, quote, you can't really call him cruel if you take into account the age in which he lived and compare him with other emperors of the time. Xiao Yu fires back. But yeah, why did he have to kill his friends and even have some of their families murdered? Quote, he bore a knife in his breast in the place where his heart should have been. Mao, unflustered, responds, yeah, those same friends probably would have overthrown him. 
<laughs> that if he had if he had not acted in such a manner, he wouldn't have been in power long. And here comes the crucial exchange, as Xiao Yu remembers it. Quote, so in order to be successful in politics, one must kill one's friends? Quote, we both knew, Xiao Yu remembered the tension, that he, Mao, was identifying himself with that Chinese emperor and his ambition. A critic might say, you make too much of a conversation that an ideological enemy of Mao's will write decades later. Uh, I think I think we see a strong resonance with how if we take Mao's views seriously, that he thinks what he's doing is right and is not simply viewing himself as an evil dictator. It, it, I think this resonates quite strongly with how he likely rationalized his view, not from a place of cynicism, but from a place in his own mind of authenticity. What was Mao's affinity for the great Ming Dynasty classic novels? He was very affected by those. Yeah. So this is another thing, right? We want to see... I think kind of the brutish leader. And there are things about Mao and power that we would describe as brutish, right? Uh, But uh, this is a bibliophile through and through, uh, that it is water margin, you know, the the romance of the three kingdoms, journey to the West, that these classics of Chinese literature, this is what he's reading. Uh, This is what obsesses him as a a child. And by the way, as a kid, he reads on his dad's farm. He has to hide it from his dad because his dad gets mad. He's like, why are you wasting time reading? This is only to help the family business. And Mao, as a kid, will hide away uh, with a vegetable oil oil lamp, a tiny little flame, and stay up all night reading books like Water Margin. And so this is something I argue we should take seriously because we see it resonate with his later uh, time aspiring for power in the Civil War and so on. So, you know, talk about Water Margin. What are we talking about? We're talking about the story of Robin Hood-esque rebels, to put it in that vein for the sake of, you know, for those who haven't read the book. Um, who are willing to fight against what they view as the tyrannical actions of an emperor who is out of touch with the people, who will, will go into the mountains uh, and, and struggle, right, so to speak. And it's actually Mao who will go in, into the mountains and follow this lead in reality. And the, the book's protagonist, Song Jiang, that in water margin, as he is struggling with another band of outlaws to you know, bring the emperor uh, to heel, that he's not an outlaw, but that, quote, he always assisted those in distress and raised those who had been crushed down by life. That water margin describes Song Jiang as the welcome rain whose influence was like the falling of rain on parched soil. And in its mouth later on at the height of the Cultural Revolution will be described as, quote, the very red sun that shines most brilliantly in our hearts. It's water margin that encourages Mao, and there's endless other influences as well. This is just an important one to be emphasized. Uh, that leads Mao to admire these rebels who were willing to go the distance, right? Who are willing to struggle. It's actually as Mao is moving towards this revolutionary career when he's asked, you know, there's a discussion, what should we do? And he says, imitate, you know, the heroes of, you know, Liang Chengbo, uh, the water margin heroes. And this book plays a role in his life that, that is important. And I think that's coming again from a place that is genuine, a place of real belief about, you know, what the hero is willing to do. And he's influenced in that regard. Mao was another in a long line of great people in history who had a teacher or mentor who ended up having such a profound impact on the direction of their lives. Tell me about Yang Changchi and his daughter and their impact on Mao. Yang Changchi is a really important influence at the first normal school in Hunan. Um, this is a teacher a, who is widely respected by students. Uh, this is someone who had studied in Japan and Europe. Um, he taught philosophy, ethics, and education. His knowledge of the Confucian classics you know, was so great that the kids, you know, the young people, they nicknamed him Confucius and viewed him as kind of a reincarnation you know, uh, of, of Confucius. But uh, Yang was a disciplined, austere person who stressed over and over to students. And picture Mao as a young person. Picture not uh, the cynical dictator who's going to destroy his enemies through terror, but the earnest young person. And and as I started off this conversation, we can do this without losing sight of what Mao actually does and the suffering he caused. It's because we care about those who will suffer from his rule that we have to return to the young person who is not the bloodthirsty murderer that we're going to caricature but an earnest young person in the classroom listening to a brilliant teacher. And this brilliant teacher tells his students, quote, every day one must do something difficult to strengthen one's own will, saying that, you know, every day I take a cold bath. It strengthens the will. It's good for the health. 
And you'll see Mao and Xiao Yu, for that matter, who will start to do things like this while they're in school. There's also, you know, Mao will be quoted saying, to, to wash our feet in ice water makes us acquire courage and dauntlessness, as, as well as audacity. In the earliest writings we ha have by Mao, we see echoes of, of Yang Chengqi. And the biggest thing that he learns in that classroom is that, and again, what's the historical context for listeners? You know, China, we're, we're, we're in the aftermath of the collapse of the Qing dynasty. We're at a time of, of chaos in Chinese history and in a, in a, amid a century of, in, of humiliation. And it's this teacher who, speaking to these earnest students, tells them, there's no greater goal in your life than to be just, moral, and virtuous. Aim high. Work hard. Serve the greater good through individual struggle. Your country, country desperately needs you. And you should think of this as the way. Establish an ironclad will. Find an ideological goal that will help our people and die for it if you must. Refuse to let time or hardship diminish your commitment to that. Quote, faith in rebirth through heroic effort, as one writer has characterized it. Quote, a person with a strong will, Yang will tell them, can suppress his evil desires, can withstand the oppression of the powerful, can succeed in casting great influence upon the world. The teacher will say to Yang Mao, destroy the habitual self. And realize the ideal self. Destroy bad habits. Destroy those bad traditions which might hold you back. And realize a dramatic rebirth. We see the same kind of language being repeated by young Mao. Quote, from the demise of the old universe will come a new universe. And will it not be better than the old universe? Without destruction, quote unquote, there can be no construction. If you want to understand that line of thought, which will define the Cultural Revolution in certain respects, you return to Yang's classroom. And, and by the way, Mao at this age isn't like the, the you know the the hardcore kid who knows he's going to be able to do this. He'll write to Xiao Yu that he is nervous, that he is not going to be able to live up to this. He'll he'll write Xiao Yu and say, "quote I'm," and this isn't just from Mao Zedong and I were beggars. This is from the collected writings that we have of Mao from this age. "Quote." I am frightened morning and night, and I'm ashamed to face up to the ideal of the superior man. Um, will I be able to be this person? Steely confidence was still in utero for him. So when the rural, rich farmer's son got to Changsha around the time of the Xinhai Revolution, that's really when things start happening. How did young Mao Zedong make the most of this situation? It seems like everything in his youth was leading up to this moment in the Hunan yeah. provincial capital. So, so yeah, now we're talking, you know, spring of 1911, he arrives in Changsha and it's, it's extraordinary for him. He is a provincial, right? He has, um, you know, he's 18 years old and he shows up in a city with foreign goods and electric lights, trains and so on. Uh, and he's free of his father's farm. <laughs> he doesn't have to be on the farm, right? And he could pursue his education in a major city. You know, a couple major things happen. You know, right? Revolution intervenes in October 1911. Uh, he is able to see history taking shape. Um, and he, in this moment, as he'll say in Red Star over China, uh, you know, that he will help, you know, assault and cut the hair of those who did not want to cut off, uh, you know, their braids in the back, uh, per Manchu, Manchu traditions. Uh, but what's most important about Changsha, what most stands out, is he begins to consider what will come of his life. He's in the army for a short time and so on, but what's really important, he doesn't do any fighting. He starts to wonder, what will I be? He thinks about becoming a police officer, uh, a lawyer, a businessman, a soap maker. Now I posit to listeners that maybe somewhere in an alternative universe, um, you know, Adolf Hitler became a famous artist and Joseph Stalin became a priest and Mussolini became a, you know, a long time elementary school teacher and, and, and Mao became a soap maker. But that was not what was to be. He had a bigger vision for himself about like what he could do with his life. And that didn't start with guns. That started at the Hunan Provincial Library, where for six months he is able to show up to that library. By the way, his dad, you know, still helping him out financially, which is another thing. His dad is stern and abusive, but it's his dad who allows him to apply to all these schools. And he's still getting support from home. So it, it, we automatically are getting further and further away from just trauma creating Mao. So the, fa the fact that his dad supports his education is absolutely indispensable. I, I don't reject the notion that trauma was important and the relationship with his dad mattered. That's true. But I'm talking about the what would I privilege most in that conversation. Okay, at the provincial library, what do we see? We see a kid showing up from the second that it opens until the minute it closes, reading. 
Uh, he's reading The Wealth of Nations, The Origin of Species, uh, Evolution and Ethics, System of Logic, The Study of Sociology, Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. This is a guy reading about ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, he's studying a map on the wall to make sure everything is happening. Although his geography was really never quite good. At one point at the height of his power, um, <laughs> Julia Lovell has noted in her book on global malism that Brazilian diplomats showed up to Beijing. And when he was talking to them, he asked where Brazil was. So <laughs> his geography, uh, whether that anecdote is 100 percent accurate or not, it's an interesting one. His geography is never that good. But as a young person, what matters most for Mao is um, he falls in love with the power of ideas. Uh, and that is profoundly important for his future. What will he do? What will he make of his life? Oh, by, by the way, I'll throw out here really quickly. It's Xiao Yu's brother, Emmy Xiao, to use you know, his easy name, so to speak, who will write one of the very first biographies of Mao Zedong. And he'll speak about all this, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Mao's knowledge of geography. There's a, there's a few world leaders who also suffer from this affliction, not to mention uh, an American president or two. <laughs> Uh, Mao would make fun of this. You say, who cares, right? You're talking about a leader who would not be embarrassed to appear in his bathrobe in front of a diplomat. Why? This also goes back to his childhood with Xiao Yu at the first normal school. It, this is utterly irrelevant to what really matters, which is the battle of ideas, right? Which is the force of personality to see the realization of a certain idea. I have people who can read maps, right? I don't, I, I don't care about uh, my appearance in that regard. This is utterly irrelevant to what we should actually be talking about. That, that's the vein there for Mao. Hmm. So you've written about Mao's early years, before evil. Knowing all this, what can you say about the dictator he became? What would you, I mean, having studied his early years so deeply like you have, what do you have to say about the historic Mao? I would start with what Zhou Enlai learned through a lot of hard lessons, which was that he won over and over and over, and longtime associates around him quickly learned that it was best to be on his side. Let's describe Mao at the height of his power. Um, five foot 11, balding with a healthy belly. Uh, he adored eating fatty pork, and spicy foods. He wasn't a very good father. You might call him a bad father, but the death of his oldest son in the Korean War pained him deeply. He smoked profusely, enjoyed dancing, loved swimming, read constantly, especially Chinese history. Wrote poetry, married willingly three times, ending up with uh, Jiang Qing. Um, and he is someone that you would have met poolside, Laszlo. If, he, if you were meeting Mao, and I'm generalizing here, but Li Jiusui, his doctor, will describe him in a very similar situation. It wasn't poolside, but it was close enough. Um, meeting Mao, you would see someone possibly clad in a bathrobe, uh, but who would be gregarious. Someone who'd be very friendly, eager to put you at ease. He always liked to, to greet guests, as he did his doctor, Li Jiu for the first time, with a history book in hand. He would want to start a conversation about the book to diminish your nerves, establish your rapport, laughing and joking. He was very good at getting other people to open up, even as he only himself carefully revealed what he really thought. And I don't want to reduce this to a caricature, but the reality of his time and power is someone to cross him to make a misstep. This was someone who was vengeful and ruthless and forgot nothing. This was someone who rebelled against everyone and everything, literally rebels against time itself by refusing even basic routines. Quote, I graduated from the University of Outlaws, he liked to say. If I'm going to swim in the swift currents of a river, you're going to join me, right? You're not going to tell me that's too dangerous. This is someone who also at the height of his power who wins over and over in these political battles through Machiavellian intrigues, right? But also is deeply motivated by the idea that he is the hero, right? That he could bring things to be as he thought ideologically they should be in his own um, rendering of what Marx, Marxist-Leninism would mean for China. But this was also someone at the height of his power who had, you know, psych psychological neuroses at times. His doctor will say that, this is someone who suffered from insomnia, dizziness, itchiness, impotence, panic attacks. And uh, at times he could be paranoid. Had, had someone poisoned my swimming pool? Was an assassin hiding in the attic of my villa waiting to kill me? He worried about these things. Uh, sometimes he didn't sleep for up to 30 hours. Uh, he, and again, refused to follow routines. But I, the crucial thing that I think we, we, we can say is that on a personal level, he behaves quite deplorably as the dictator. He is horrendous with women. He treats women as sexual servants. 
Um, it is deeply disturbing his behavior with women in power. Uh, and we also see someone, when we talk about the notion of, of power itself and the implementation of ideas, who's utterly convinced that what he is doing is right. And when it is challenged, it becomes a very dangerous moment for those who would challenge him. Um, if, if we look at uh, uh, you know, Peng Dewey uh, and the aftermath of the Great Leap Forward unfolding. And so when we're talking about Peng, right, we're talking about a famed general from the Civil War. We're talking about uh, a general who leads Chinese forces against American troops and UN troops in Korea and is quite successful, uh, who will challenge Mao over his treatment of women at the height of his power and say, you act like an emperor with a harem. Uh, that goes really poorly for Peng, and he will be relentlessly persecuted uh, in the Cultural Revolution. Or perhaps maybe if we talk about this point of the notion of his delusions of heroism, what happens when he's challenged. Frank Dakota in his uh, trilogy uh, on liberation, on Mao's great famine and the Cultural Revolution, will recall one story that most stands out to me, which is that um, Liu Xiaoqi, will challenge Mao as the famine is unfolding. Um, you know, Liu Xiaoqi has been to his home village, has seen people starving, and Mao sitting beside a swimming pool, you know, Liu will say to him, like, do you know what's happened? Do you, do you know how many people have died? Do you know that even cannibalism has taken place? And then he challenges Mao and he says, we're responsible. This is going to go into the history books. And Frank Dakota has recorded that that was the moment, probably, where Mao looked at this person and said, this person is my enemy. This is, this is the Khrushchev waiting to be born. And so what do we make of that? Not only that Mao was a, a dictator uh, who was going to protect his power and was not going to be upended by underlings, much less the number two, but this was also someone who likely really believed that what he was doing was right. This notion of larger stories of delusions of heroism. And to challenge that, that was most dangerous because you were challenging his very self-identity. Mm, sounds familiar in our modern day. You know, we were talking about Yang Changji, and we didn't mention his daughter. She had a pretty important role in Mao's early life, Yang Kaihui. She was Mao's second wife. Well, actually, some will say it was the first, but anyway, <laughs> Yang Kaihui, he loved her and was really shaken when she was executed. Yeah, and by the way, for, so for listeners, note that Mao's dad forced him as a teenager into an, a first marriage, right? And Mao will refuse to consummate it, or you know, doesn't want to be married to this person, will run away. Which is another interesting point before we talk about uh, Yang's daughter, Kawe, which is that, um, you know, even after Mao refused his father's first arranged marriage, like literally runs away and, does, and, and humiliates his father, even after that, his dad will still support his education will still support him in certain respects, which is he had humiliated his father through refusing that arranged marriage. So the, the second you know, marriage, the second really major relationship in his life, again, we return, we return to uh, the aftermath of Yang's classroom, which is um, Yang Chongqi would have students over to his house. Xiao Yu would recall this, uh, and they would go to his house after class or on weekends and, and again, talk about ideas. And it's there that you know, Mao meets his daughter, Kawe, and um, they develop a really serious love affair. There's allegations that Mao will cheat on her. Um, and But after Yang dies suddenly in 1920, which may or may not have been linked to a very cold bath on a winter morning, um, they started a really intense relationship that actually their lovemaking in school dorms uh, provoked complaints. Uh, what, why, why do I emphasize that? Because it was a real relationship. Um, and that this was a young couple, by all accounts, that really was... Uh, deeply emotionally attached to one another. Uh, and what follows, though, is that after they will split, even though they will have you know, several kids and Mao will apparently be unfaithful, is that as you're getting deeper into you know, the beginnings of the Civil War, she is captured um, by Mao's enemies. And what happens to Ka Wei is extraordinary in the sense that she refuses to denounce Mao. We're, we're talking at a time in which Mao had effectively abandoned her um, and wanted nothing to do with her, when all she had to do was denounce Mao and say that, you know, this was you know, a horrible person. I want nothing to do with him. But in November 1930, when she is captured by his enemies, she refuses to denounce him. So his enemies, Yang's daughter, his enemies take Yang's daughter and march her outside of a village. She's wearing a thin blouse and they shoot her on a cloudy morning. She doesn't die initially. 
She apparently lies suffering on the ground, fingers digging into the dirt, determination sustaining her weakening heart. Her executioners go to lunch, and then they come back and they murder her all over again. Uh, Mao will recall her loss. You know, someone like his doctor, his physician, uh, Li Jiu will say that he always perceived a total lack of human feeling from Mao in many respects, a distinct lack of empathy. And we'll say, you know, perhaps he'd seen too many people die. Li Jiu Sui will recall a moment where an acrobat fell during a show and was really badly injured and everybody was really upset and that Mao, you know, didn't seem to really care. And so whole highlight is this, you know, this was a, a person who seemed to kind of lack empathy for anyone. But, um, you know, Conway kind of speaks to the opposite in this one instance. It doesn't mean that Mao is a deeply feeling person. What it does mean is, He's a human being. In 1957, Mao, you know, we're talking now, 27 years later, will write a uh, a poem for a widow. And in this poem, uh, he'll say, quote, and he's writing this to someone who's lost their husband, and he's he's recalling Kawe. He'll say, quote, I lost my proud poplar and you your willow. Poplar and willow soar to the ninth heaven. Wugong asked what he can give, serves them a laurel wine. The lonely moon goddess spreads her ample sleeves, to dance for these loyal souls in infinite space. Earth suddenly reports the tiger subdued. Tears of joy pour forth, falling as mighty rain. Those are sublime words. And maybe they speak to not only Mal's self-pity, which he was obviously very capable of feeling, but perhaps even genuine sorrow for a young woman who loved him, who he had not treated particularly well, but who died for him. So after knowing all that you've introduced about Mao's early life and his formative years and these other 20th century dictators, do we let them off the hook or cut them some slack for the death and suffering they caused to tens and tens of millions of people? I know you mentioned that as one of the caveats, but after seeing their humanity and learning about their early life, how should we think about them? It makes them more culpable. It makes them more guilty in my mind. And what do I mean by that? Rather than seeing, you know, and this is kind of the issue, psychopathology, mental conditions really matter, right? This does shape people's behavior and this is part of their story. But, uh, you know, a a, a mental condition or a, a health condition of the mind does not definitively determine that someone is going to behave in a certain way. But even if we say that someone has a mental condition that does indeed influence them to behave a certain way. I think we have to be really careful by suggesting that people like Mao or people like Hitler or Stalin are only a product of those psychopathological diagnoses that, in other words, maybe said more simply, that mental health conditions render them, you know, uh, having a less, having less agency, right? That they are driven to do what they did, not because they embraced certain ideas through their own agency and because they really believed them, but because they had this mental condition that made them behave in this way. The mental health part matters, and that's part of the puzzle. But the reason why they're more guilty is a result of this humanization. The reason why they're more capable, because it speaks to people that weren't born as necessarily Jeffrey Dahmer-esque kids who like to hurt animals. It kind of be, that's not the reality of this. We see kids who love to read. We see people who are genuine and wanting to make the world a better place. And we come to terms with the fact, or we have to try to come to terms with the fact, they made the decisions they made, not only because of other influences in their mind and so on, and and numerous other structural variables, but because they made the decisions they made because they believed they were right and they made them as human beings. Their humanity speaks to their agency. They chose to do what they did. They chose it. That's what the story of humanizing them emphasizes. It reveals the stories of individuals who could behave rationally in so many respects, who then behaved with great cruelty and yet rationalized it as right. That's a story of human agency. That's what makes them more guilty, not less. Well, history is well documented that. So you mentioned, I think in your foreword, when you were writing this book, you always had ambient and orchestral soundtracks playing in the background. What did you listen to? I, first off, love that question, right? Uh, as, I, as I have talked about the book, um, are you the first person? You mentioned the playlist, but I didn't see that in the book. It's in the footnote. It's uh, in the footnote. Okay, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. I never read footnotes. Who's got time for that? What am I, an Check academic? out the footnote. There is a playlist. And uh, I actually am writing an article about this for um, um, a music site. And I am interested in the ways that ambient music uh, can heighten our degree of focus as we read and can enrich our understanding of certain material. 
through making it a more engaging process. Some people don't like to read and listen to music. It's distracting. You know, that makes total sense. But, but I was uh, really interested in a number of artists who I listen to a lot. Johnny Greenwood, who's the guitarist for Radiohead, has made a, a lot of soundtracks. Uh, he made one called Phantom Thread, which Spotify let me know I listened to 21 times over 2021 while writing Finishing Before Evil. Uh, Johnny Greenwood's uh, Phantom Thread. Johnny Greenwood's uh, There Will Be Blood soundtrack, which sounds more intentional in terms of the name of why I'm mentioning it, but really there's not much bloodshed in that movie. Um, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross have a number of soundtracks uh, for different movies, which I think are quite intense. In terms of ambient music, um, I would think about someone, of course, like maybe Brian Eno. There's another group called Stars of the Lid, uh, The Dead Texan, A Winged Victory for the Solon. Uh, and uh, these are atmospheric uh, albums in many respects. Another one would be Steve Hosschild, uh, Losel, Jonas Reinhardt. Now you may not be able to spell out some of these names, friends who are listening, but if you, I if listen you, to them all. You do. And That's, I have my own Johnny Greenwood playlist on Spotify. I'll send. Oh you the my link. goodness. Last we're, we're kindred spirits. Well, I'm really interested in, there's a quote I mentioned in the opening part of the book. Uh, and this quote essentially is this question returning to of, should we feel for these types uh, of leaders and, and, and why. I think that feeling, and I think music helps create these feelings, um, enables us to think more deeply. Now, you know, emotions and hysteria among large groups of people may not lead to critical thinking, but if we reason deeply, and now I'm quoting Mary Wollstonecraft in the Enlightenment, quote, we reason deeply when we forcibly feel. Uh, and so as we think about feeling for Mao uh, lo losing his, uh, you know, we'll call it his first wife, when we think about someone like Vladimir Lenin experiencing his older brother being hanged by the czar and so on, um, the music of Johnny Greenwood, the music of these artists we're talking about, it's powerful. And I, I think it heightens that, those feelings. And I would like to see more historians and more writers of all stripes. Although I just wrote an article about this. There's lots of been efforts at this. Work in more music that for readers who are interested in this uh, can have maybe a more absorbing reading experience. Great idea. It helps shape our reality in a way that is really intellectually substantive. It creates greater focus and it creates a more beautiful daily reality to have this music going for, for me anyway, right? For different listeners, it'll be different. And I also, I, I'm interested in the ways that history and our discussions can intersect with other areas, which we may not necessarily think as being conducive to greater artistic or intellectual thought. Of all the men that you wrote about, which one was the most interesting to research and present? Mm, that's really hard. Um, well, I would say a, a couple. I, I would say Lenin for me was super interesting in the sense that um, he has the happiest childhood out of all these individuals. That he has, you know, in many respects, a lovely childhood. He grows up in a home with a really loving mother. Mother, his, his father is stern, but he's a good dad, and he, and he really cares about his children. He cares about their education, um, and so Lenin for me is the most paradoxical in the sense that he goes such a radical direction after his older brother is hanged by the czar for a conspiracy to kill the czar, and and Marxism and ideas radicalize him. But he, of all these dictators, um, maybe goes furthest from a happy childhood to the heights of terror. And, you know, in 1918, he'll, he'll write a telegram, you know, essentially saying, and it's, you can look it up, it's Lenin's Hanging Telegram. You can find a copy online quite easily. It's the best evidence of his crimes against humanity in a really one-page format. He'll say, you know, hang, hang without mercy, 100 known kulaks, meaning rich peasants, bloodsuckers. He'll say, take, he'll say, take hostages. He'll say, P.S., find some truly hard men. What stands out to me about that is uh, he's talking about people like his own family. He'll, he'll write um, in 1920, uh, he'll have to do, everyone in the Bolshevik regime and, you know, is asked to do a, a survey about their class background. And what does Lenin write for his? He writes noblemen. His dad had been, had, had earned, uh, you know, had earned the rank of what, a hereditary noble. Lenin was technically a noble. Um, and that, that's grim humor from the same person sending people like his own family to their, their deaths. The other is uh, Mussolini. Has a, a contradiction I still can't wrap my mind around. Uh, we're talking about a warmonger, or so a shameless opportunist who invents an ideology. He's, not, he's a classic opportunist, yet really cares about ideas. He's a warmonger who proclaims peace. He's a, an extreme philanderer. 
who supposedly loves his wife. The last thing he, one of the last things he writes is a letter to his wife about you have been for me the only woman whom I ever really loved. He never wanted to be around her. She scared him. Um, and then he dies with his mistress. Um, a, a passionate bibliophile obsessed with books who ignored basic facts. Um, he'll do things like straight up lie to you that he could read Greek. At one point, his son Romano like chimes in. He's like, dad, you can't read Greek. <laughs> that, that, that actually happens. Um, a, a loving father who spends very little time with his kids. His son Romano ends up becoming a, a jazz musician. will write a, a loving memoir of his dad, which is kind of an, uh, it's, he acts as an apologist, so to speak, for a lot of his, what his dad did. Um, he'll survive an ugly wound from friendly fire in the World War I. Um, in World War One, he'll survive violent sword duels, who, who, including one in 1921 when he nearly kills a newspaper editor. He survives car and airplane crashes, uh, numerous assassination attempts. He should have been dead. There's no way this guy should have made it uh, to what you would consider the heights of his power in maybe the mid-1930s. Super cautious, but also reckless. A man who, and now I use another historian's words, who, quote, combined the ferocity of the tyrant with the hesitations of a child. He bragged his skull was bulletproof. It wasn't, uh, but was really afraid to get shots at the doctor. His daughter, Etta, will say he would tense up so hard when getting an injection that it literally broke the needle on one occasion. Uh, he was a fascist who sought to create a totalitarian regime, a war criminal responsible for a million deaths uh, from Italy to Ethiopia to Libya. But he was also a tragic buffoon who became lost in a dream until its consequences shook him awake. Uh, as I quote in the book, uh, Thucydides from the history of the Peloponnesian War. War was a stern teacher after all. Well, I'd love to keep this going and look at the other five lives you discussed in the book, but we have to stay true to our mission here at the CHP and present Chinese history. So I encourage everyone interested to learn more about these figures from the last century to go check out Before Evil, Young Lenin, Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini, Mao, and Kim. It's coming out April 26th on Tortoise Books. Brendan Gauthier, anything more we can add before we sign off? I, um, listeners, uh, if you're interested in reading the book, you can go to beforeevil.com, and there's several different ways to acquire it, you know, from the publisher to other major platforms where you can get the book. Uh, and I I'm really continue to be interested in something that matters so tremendously for our daily reality, which is this notion of, a commitment to love, empathy, and mercy, even as we seek to hold people accountable? And how do we grapple with the worst crimes we can think of? How do we grapple with those who have behaved with such inhumanity, but grapple with them as human beings? And, and that remains profoundly important. And, and that's been my aspiration. And I hope that will resonate with listeners. It was a real pleasure to speak with you. I love your show. Thanks again for having me on. It's my pleasure. Yeah, it was great to have you here. I really enjoyed the discussion. And I'll come out to New Hampshire to visit. Nice place. I, I, I will have Johnny Greenwood waiting uh, with a lovely cup of tea. Well, that's all the incentive I need. I'll call you next time I'm in Manchester. Well, I guess there's nothing more to do except thank each and every one of you for listening. This has been a special episode. i got a good one coming out for you any day now. Part one of a two-part series. This is Laszlo Montgomery. Signing off from Los Angeles, California, IA, and treating you to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.